Today we're going to talk about Sarah Boone, and she's in trouble for having her boyfriend in a suitcase, and then he passed away. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, quite simply, the first video is the police arriving on the scene, and then detectives later, the first set of videos. So what we're going to see is her first reaction to law enforcement showing up. There's no nothing dramatic. We don't even know what comes of her as a result of this set of videos. So that's what we got. Each of them has to, so this might be a real scene. So each of them has to put their name Normally in we all just, I just put everybody. Yeah, you go. working. Um, what's going on? Sorry, so I just got here, so fill me in. No problem. Like, yeah, he and I were putting a puzzle together. We've been doing some artwork together. You were putting a puzzle together? Yes, we have a puzzle that we started in there. Okay. We've been doing art, trying to take stuff off the wall to, to make new art put up there, like having a good time with one another. But we're drinking. We had a bottle of wine last night. Okay. So wow. then it's like, we decided to play hide and seek, right? Okay. So he gets in the suitcase, okay? Who is this guy? That's my ex-husband. My former husband. How did he, he live here with you guys? No. I called him over here. Okay, okay. I didn't know what to do. Okay. I didn't know what to do. Okay. So then he came over here. Here, let's talk in private, okay? I called you guys. Mm-hmm. I tried funny. giving you a I, I, The problem is, is yeah. I fell asleep. I fell asleep. When did you do CPR? This morning. When I found it. Before you called? Yes! It's one o'clock right now. I tried... I was awake, but I actually got out of the bed at like 12.30ish, whatever. So I came downstairs, and I was like, oh, he's in the suitcase still. And that's when I found him, and I took him out, and I tried doing CPR, and then I called him, and then I called you guys. Did he get here before the fire department got here? Who? Your husband? Or yes. your ex-husband? Yes. Okay. Where did he live at? Uh, right down the street. Okay. So you were playing, and who zipped him up in I did, okay. but then I fell asleep. Okay, okay, so you're okay. I don't, I wasn't here. I'm just trying to figure out what happened. I fell asleep, so I don't know if he's suffocated or like had an aneurysm or a heart attack or what. What kind of medical conditions does he have? None that I know of. Nothing that you know of. None that I take know any of. No, advice, no, no. no All we had was a bottle of wine. Literally, okay. just a bottle of wine. Okay. Doing puzzle artwork. Then we decided to play hide and seek. Mm-hmm. That's all that happened. Okay, okay. So I don't know if he had a heart attack or what in there. Like, I don't know what happened. So how long were you doing CPR on him prior to you calling 911? You tried that all morning? Yes. Okay. And then I called him while I was what doing CPR. What time did you start? Probably you in a ballpark? Here, let me fill this deputy in, okay? Please may I have my Dr. Pepper? I am no, so cut now right second. now. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so... In the time that we are looking at, this is her first contact with the police. Now, one of the things that you always know is that people are not accustomed to dealing with police officers because they don't know the difference between a patrolman and a detective and they start feeding information. This, The reason I have this true crime workshop thing up is that's exactly the whole approach in true crime workshop. We talk about that very difficult time for people to know the difference. So when the first cop shows up, she starts feeding information to that cop like that's the investigator. When in fact, most of the time that cop's gonna try to pick up a few details and secure the area and wait for the officer in charge of the detective to come in and start asking the right questions. Immediately she starts, it sounds like a bad 911 call. She starts clearing instead of, you know, we talk about steering versus clearing. Steering you to the solution means that I want this solved. Clearing means, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. Now, does that mean that a person's guilty? Well, clearly we know she was involved with this. So she's going to try to get out of it as much as she can. When she's talking about what they were doing. There's a lot of illustrators. If I were the cop, I would say, hold on a minute. You had somebody get in a suitcase would be my first question, I, but that's not what she asked. She does a great job of continuing to ask, even though it looks like something that is hard, that almost impossible to believe that a person is in a suitcase. So when she starts to talk, then she rattles along. It was art. It was this non-pertinent information, things that have nothing to do with a guy dying. But when she gets to the crux of the matter about getting in the suitcase, she eye blocks. And so then we, and she does a qualifier. She says, we decide to play hide and seek. I don't know how getting in a suitcase is hide and seek. You know where somebody's at for sure. I don't know what you'd call that. I think there's a whole lot of questions I'd want to ask if I were sitting here. You see that burp? That could be gastric distress from the stress, but it's highly likely that it's a hangover because she says, I'm cotton mouth. She talks all through this thing about how she's feeling. The crux of her story, though, is 
where she is gets really animated when she says, I fell asleep and she's really animated. That's what she's trying to do is to get that message across more than any other part of this, more than any other part. And you can see that desperation in her face and in her voice because the story isn't working like she wanted it to. The woman's asking her questions that she was not wanting to get out. <laughs> she gets emphatic. She, and then she does this thing where she starts to draw her hands in. Her hands start to draw up. And that's useful. When I look at somebody whose hands are doing that, I've seen it a few times in my life in real life and under high duress, people's hands will ball up and they'll curl up in the floor. But your hands are becoming useless to you when you are curling your fingers together. And the only way I can equate that is I, I don't have the tools to do this. I think I've heard Lena Sisko call it the claw of something, claw of deception or something like that. That's her words for it. So seeing a person's hands do this is an interesting one. Then she introduces this perp vanishing perpetrator chase there's no vanishing perpetrator here i think she's bringing the perpetrator to the dance early when she says we drank a bottle of wine and that was all she's got some residual emotion that looks good when she shows shock and fear and all that stuff we always say truthful people show when something has happened and i'm i'm not going to take the rest of this there's a whole lot of stuff in here she tries to edit as she's speaking she throws out those words just individual words like puzzles artwork Something's going on. And then when the woman validates her story and said, you did CPR all morning. Yes. She jumps on to validate it. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I, I agree with you on all those points. One thing that really stood out to me in this clip here is that the story is completely chronological. And this is a huge red flag, but there's an exception to this. If, if you say, walk me through everything that happened and you tell them to be chronological you can't uh, you can't call that a red flag. She was not suggested to to do this. So that would be a a pretty big red flag. Most stories for investigators, most stories after any huge incident will start with the incident, or that will have the center stage, not the entire lead up in the story. So the emotional spikes are usually at the beginning. And then she starts offering possible medical conditions, possible causes of death, injecting more ambiguity into the situation. And the, I think the story is prearranged and rehearsed, and every detail is added in there. She gets offended when she's asked when she started doing CPR. And this video clip alone would have me believing that there was deception and that I am probably talking to the suspect. If I was that officer, Taking those notes, I would think just because of this one clip, I am talking to my prime suspect right here, just based on those uh, couple of things. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. This is the classic first encounter with a with a suspect or the suspect with the police. The officer goes over the discovery of the body and all the information she can gather at that point. All the things that Greg talked about. Everything in here is so classic. Everybody's going to cover these. So, Mark, I won't take the rest of them that 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 everybody else has. And I'll briefly go over some of the other things. Um, like Greg was saying, she she covers things that have nothing to do with what happened. When you get there, when you're this is this is basically the 911 call, sort of, or, or her version of it, and or another version of it. And going back to the burp where, where Greg talked about where she burps, this is we, we've seen that before on uh, the guy from the Jinx. What, what was that guy's name? Uh Hirsch. Oh yeah, Roll Durst. Does. Yeah, yeah. So I think your stomach's. I think you're right, Greg. It could be from a hangover. It could be from, but from one bottle of wine. I wonder, I wonder how that would happen. Okay. So yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah. So I think that they could probably be that. Or when as she's lying, she she it's starting to dawn on her uh, how much trouble she's going to be in. So her stomach may be getting up upset a little bit and may start churning a little bit on her. So let's talk about blink rate just a little bit. Her blink rate. It, go, it slows down, it speeds up, it slows down, it speeds up. And there are several theories about why our blink rate speeds up. And one of the ones that I that I always lean toward is the Joe Navarro theory, where he, where he talks about how it goes back to how we were animals on the, the, the Serengeti, you know, back a long time ago. And when our limbic system pops off, because something's chasing us or getting ready to chase us, we see a, a tiger or a, some animal's getting ready to get us, our heart rate jumps up. Uh, um, our breathing rate goes up and we start to to make sure our eyes are clean because they start getting dry because everything starts drying up as you as your heart beats faster preparing all your muscles to start running and I think that's and I agree with Joe when he says he thinks that's more of a 
uh, like a window cleaning situation, like a windshield wiper to make sure your eyes are clean and clear. So you'll see what all is going on around you when you start. So when you start running, you'll, you'll have a better chance of getting away. Um, then she explains, um, she, she goes from, we were playing, playing hide and go seek, uh, to the problem of what happened is that she fell asleep. And I'm with Greg. I don't know what kind of game you're playing where somebody, you're going to talk somebody into getting into a suitcase and then letting them zip it up. That's crazy talk. And how's that hide and seek where you know where they're hiding? There's no hiding there and there's no seeking there except him, I guess, seeking a way out. It's corny, but that's, there's, a, there's a lot more in there, but I'll, I'll leave some for you, Mark. Yeah. Um, look, so I would say pretty immediately, this is the person, this is the perpetrator. Just like you say, Chase, it, it's, it's immediately apparent. However, I'm not there. What does the person who's there think? Well, I think she thinks this is the perpetrator as well, because um, you'll see a little moment where the interviewer pulls her hair back. There's no reason for her to pull her hair back. Her hair isn't in her eye. And she does that after the Penelope pit stop, like, yes, yes, that she, which is like the Penelope pit stops, hey, help, hey, help, just for the for the uh, fans out there of Penelope Pit Stop, there's that extreme look. It's, it's not that you're a liar if you talk like that. It's just it's so out of baseline for her that even the interviewer reacts and pulls back, imagines pulling back her hair. She knows that this is the the culprit, I think. Um, when did you first do CPR? There's a head tilt from her on there. So I think she's judging the threat in front of her. By the way, earlier on as well, lots of indirect gestures as well. Look, this is an important thing. Somebody's died. You'd expect if you're being interviewed that you want to give really direct information rather than kind of fluffy and airy and watery information. But she's all, you know, flowery and watery and airy over here, not direct. Uh, then we get uh, it's it's one o'clock right now. So there's a there's an idea that, that there's no logic to this. When did you first um, uh, do CPR this morning? The head tilts. Um, then uh, it's one o'clock right now. She says, I tried in a heightened uh um, tension. Then she composes herself as she thinks to herself, okay, I've got to get this story right now. She says, I was awake, and then there's lots of fillers, but actually, ish, whatever, like. So it really goes badly for her from moment one. I think the officer attending here knows this is most likely the person involved. Oh, and then she goes for the Dr. Pepper at the end. Again, notice the way she asks for the Dr. Pepper without any of the emotion that she was trying to put forward around the, the, the issue, the death that's gone on. Very strange, very odd. Uh, we've got a live one here. Each of them has to, so this might be a real scene. So each of them has to put their name Normally in we all just, I just put everybody. Yeah, you call it working. Um, what's going on? Sorry, you I just got here, so fill me in. No problem. Like, yeah, I'm just and I, we're putting a puzzle together. We've been doing some artwork together. You are putting a puzzle together? Yes, we have a puzzle that we started in there. Okay. We've been doing art, trying to take stuff off the wall to, to make new art put up there, like having a good time with one another. But we're drinking, we had a bottle of wine last night. Okay. Fine. So then it's like, we decided to play hide and seek, right? Okay. So he gets in the suitcase, okay? Who is this guy? That's my ex-husband. My former husband. How did he, he live here with you guys? No. I called him over here. Okay, okay. I didn't know what to do. Okay. I didn't know what to do. Okay. So then he came over here. Here, let's talk in private, okay? I called you guys. Mm -hmm. I tried giving you your brother. I, I, the problem is, is yeah. I fell asleep. I fell asleep. When did you do CPR? This morning. When I found it. Before you called? Yes! It's <laughs> one o'clock right now. I tried... I was awake, but I actually got out of the bed at like 12.30ish, whatever. So I came downstairs and I was like, oh, he's in the suitcase still. And that's when I found him and I took him out and I tried doing CPR and then I called him and then I called you guys. Did he get here before the fire department got here? Who? Your husband? Or yes. your ex-husband? Yes. Okay. Where did he live at? Uh, right down the street. Okay. So you were playing and who zipped him up in? I did, okay. but then I fell asleep. 
Okay, okay, stop. You're okay. I don't. I wasn't here. I'm just trying to figure out what happened. I fell asleep, so I don't know if he suffocated or like had an aneurysm or a heart attack or what. What kind of medical conditions does he have? None that I know of. Nothing that you know of. None that I take know any of. No, medicine. no, no. no medicine. All we had was a bottle of wine. Literally, okay. just a bottle of wine. Okay. Doing puzzle artwork. Then we decided to play hide and seek. Mm -hmm. That's all that happened. Okay, okay. So I don't know if he had a heart attack or what in there. Like, I don't know what happened. So how long were you doing CPR on him prior to you calling 911? You tried that all morning? Yes. Okay. And then I called him while I was what doing CPR. What time did you start? Probably giving me a rough ballpark. Here, let me fill this deputy in, okay? Please, may I have my Dr. Pepper? I am oh, so cut mouth right second. now. So you've had a second to kind of collect yourself. Tell it to me again. You guys were playing last night, drinking a bottle of wine. Putting puzzles together, doing artwork. Doing puzzles, artwork. Okay. Had a bottle of wine and then decided to play hide and seek. Mm -hmm. So he What gets, time was that, do you remember? I mean, I know that I was in bed probably by like what, 12.30? Okay. Well, so I went upstairs at least and I fell asleep. Okay. Forgetting that he was so in the suitcase. you guys were playing the hide and go seek? Yes. And at some point you put him in the suitcase? No, he got in the suitcase. So okay. he thought it would be funny to be put in the suitcase. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to joke with you and I'll zip you up and make him, you know, squirm a little bit, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But then I fell asleep. Mm -hmm. I fell asleep. Where was the suitcase? Right where it is. In it, right down there? Yes. You zipped him in there. Yes. Thought it would be funny, a little joke. It was. We both were laughing about it. Okay. And then I fell asleep. Where did you fall asleep at? Upstairs. In your bedroom? Yes. Okay. Totally forgetting that he was in the suitcase still. Okay. And then you came back downstairs. This morning or this afternoon? Yes, when I got up. Park, what time? Twelve thirty-ish. I was awake, but I totally forgot that he was in the suitcase. He can tell you there's a lot of things that I slash we have been going through. Jobs. Yeah, he did tell me. Life, all stuff. that good stuff. So I just totally so forgot. So you began to do CPR on him. Yes. Yes. From about and what gurgled. time this morning like did you gurgled. start doing that CPR? No, it was the afternoon. It was the afternoon it was because the afternoon. I was awake, but then I finally decided to come downstairs at like 12.30ish, whatever it is. And I was like, oh, I forgot he was in the suitcase and he wasn't moving. Nothing was happening. So I unzipped him, unzipped him, unzipped him, took him out and started doing CPR on him. Mm -hmm. He was on his way over here. I called you when he got here. Once he got here, you called him? Yes. Okay. And it, like air was coming out and he was gurgling, but... Mm -hmm. I could just tell by looking at him. But you knew how to do CPR. You were doing that on your own? Yes. Okay. And then right. the person that was on the phone with me also, I counted with him doing it. And he's got no medical. He doesn't take any medication. I don't know. Like, I don't know medical-wise. Like, what, I know he doesn't take any medications whatsoever. Okay. Um, the only thing, like I said, I don't know if alcohol had to do with it, but we had a bottle of wine. Okay. All right. Here's, I want you to sit back down because I don't want Can you. Can I have one more sip of water, please? Yeah, go, go on. Denver, signal 29, residential, audible, 1303 Island Bay Drive. I'll do what I can to get you a cup because I don't want you to have to keep doing that. The cups are like right there. Okay. Sit right here. Don't talk to the ex husband right oh, now. I won't. Okay? I won't. Can I have a cigarette, please? Ma'am, I can't take anything out of the house. It's on the back porch. Nope. All of it. It's secure, okay? I'll try my best to get you what you need, okay? Maybe one of these deputies cup. has a, a pack from someone, you know, sit down and I'll try and get you what you need, okay? Just cut, please. Okay. I don't want you on your feet. You are camera still. All right, if you don't know who we are, we're the Behavior Panel. And I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the TrueCrimeWorkshop.com, which is the only online uh, true crime uh, course you can take with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm the only uh, true crime Mark Bowden dot com. Uh, help people all over the world stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase Hughes dot com. Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. I specialize in false crimes. I did 20 <laughs> years in the U.S. military. I wrote the number one best selling book on behavior profiling, influence and persuasion. And I teach those things to people to change their lives today. Greg? Greg Hartley, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor, written 10 books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time on Wall Street, corporate America. All right. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, lovely. So um, just a couple of things on this. Uh, she says she zipped it up, make you squirm a little bit 
whatever it is. Make you squirm a little bit, whatever it is. So I love this phrase of whatever it is that she uses. She uses it on 12.30 as well. Came down 12.30, whatever it is. So, I, by the way, I think the attending officer here do, doing a fantastic job of, of getting a lot of information yeah. out of her. I'm not in this position, but if I were, I would want to get more information out of her on what do you mean, whatever it is? Not only within this act of, um, of putting somebody in a suitcase, you know, why? Why whatever it is? What more is there to that? Because clearly it isn't about uh, making you squirm a little bit. The whatever it is suggests there's something else, something more. The whatever it is on 12.30 suggests it's not quite accurate. It isn't exactly that. So that's where I'd want to jump in on that. Whatever it is, it's indefinite, it's indirect, there's a point to jump in and go, so what exactly do you mean by that? Or what really were your intentions around this? Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, Mark, I love that because anytime there's something we don't understand, we should clarify. And it might mean nothing to what we always say about all this stuff, guys. It might not mean a single thing, but it might. It might be the thing that unhinges the entire story. So if it's filler, it filler is there for a reason. If it's something to hide something, it's there for a reason. Interesting to me, when she comes in, she's got the look of disbelief. I, I'm sorry, standing beside her, first of all, let's go back and talk about the law enforcement officer who's not talking to her and look at the disbelief on his face. Look at him doing the chained elephant. Uh, that look of, uh, he's just come out of the house. There's a guy in a suitcase, unimaginable kind of a thing. So he's just sitting there going, okay, whatever. And you see him kind of looking down to his right. There's an emotional eye accessing. Then you see her come out and she goes to emphatic approval when you deliver her message. When she said, Hide and go see. Yes, there's that emphatic again. We keep seeing her, seeing her do that. Anytime you're delivering her message, she's emphatic. Now, she does mouth touching when she gets to this point. I forgot he was in the suitcase. That's comforting for some people. Could be thinking, but we're going to see her pressing on her skin, on her face a lot of times. And we're going to see her that progressively rise up, not from down low, but the more apprehensive people get often, the more you'll see their shoulders rise, things get tight, tighter and higher. You hear their voices rise. Mark, you always say when they get to that respiration, when it gets so light that their voice starts coming out from here and not below, you see all that in her as we start this whole thing. Um, she's iterative storytelling, iterative storytelling. When she touches her mouth, it could be, oh my God, but I don't think so. I think she's telling a piece and letting it out. She has planned what she's going to say when these people show. Now, did she talk with her former husband about that? Don't know. But she has planned what she intends to, stay, to say. The interesting piece, and we're all, we all know that she would be our first suspect. We've all said that. But where is the horror or remorse in any of this? That makes you immediately go, okay, she's already planning what she's going to say. And then she says, you know, we've had problems. She's already starting to disparage and chaff. So she's trying to say, boom. Now, this is interesting because later I could use it in an interrogation and I would then ask her, well, maybe you guys had baggage. You wanted him to suffer or what, whatever you're going to say. I would use that and say, yeah, maybe you didn't intend to kill him. You just wanted to torture him. You want to do this to him. You didn't want to do that. So that's a lead she's giving right now. This, the cool part is this detective just doesn't pay any, or this, this uh, officer doesn't pay any attention. She just moves right along. Then the woman moves. Sarah moves across what I call egg protector. She crosses her primary sex organs by that. I mean, her ovaries with her arm to protect and she touches her mouth. Those are red flags. Now, there's also the part where she is hungover, clearly all that water, all that needs for the water. She's hung over. So there's all kinds of things going on with that. Then she says we had a bottle of wine, just like people have two drinks when they're pulled over for DUI. That's what I think. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. This is where we sort of get a little bit more into the story, a little deeper into the story. When she answers her questions or her answers are much too fast. These should be, I mean, there should be a sense of urgency, but not like bang, not like right out of the gate like that. So that tells you that she's probably got these just moments before that she's prepped these because she can see these questions coming and she's making sure to get her point across about falling asleep for like the 40th time, we'll see it a thousand more times in here. She puts her hand up to her mouth and we do that to help calm us down. It's it's sort of an adapter. When, you, when we touch our lips, that sends a signal to the brain to relax. And so that's what she's doing. We see her touch, as we go through this, we'll see her touch her face, rubber mouth, rubber face, all those kinds of things. Those are the things that are gonna help her calm down and get rid of that built up stress or tension. Um, 
And then she's hoping to high heaven that this guy's had a stroke or a heart attack while he's in there mm-hmm. because she's saying, I don't know, maybe he's had a stroke or a heart attack. In other words, so she's, she's hoping this thing has gone wrong on his end. So she doesn't get nailed for the, for, um, uh, I don't know what they would call it at this point. I don't know if it'd be murder or manslaughter or what. She hopes she didn't get nailed for that. My favorite part though is when she drinks out of the, out of the, the water faucet there on the end, she wipes her chin, wipes her whole face and her nose off on her, on her shoulder. I mean, we used to do that in like the fifth grade when we we're out running around and stuff. So it's, it's, it's odd seeing an adult do that. So she must be at this point really thirsty, obviously, but in a, in a, a situation where her limbic system is just on fire right now and she's heating up and getting thirsty and, and, uh, in sort of a panic mode. But I think you're right, Greg, we're not seeing the, the, um, emotions on her face that we see the expressions we're not seeing what we should be seeing on that there's a lot missing from here this and from video one to here like we've all said it's deception 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 something's up you can see it on her chase what do you got yeah i agree with all y'all the one i'll just add two things here the emotion that she's experiencing is all about her experience so i think that is uh a cornerstone of this police first police officer contact deception. She redirects to the details and quickly runs through the experience of finding him very quickly. And when you see this little increase in speed, keep in mind, it depends on who you're talking to. It's typically a desire to get something that's rehearsed out as fast as possible. It shortens the amount of time that that person is experiencing stress. Uh, As far as I know, there's no research for this, but I think, Human beings are not all the same. And I hope you would at least agree with that. And that means not all are identical specimens that can be perfectly replicated in a lab, which is why some of these things are not in peer reviewed research. We can't duplicate that stuff. So in situations like this, experience is very important. And I believe he probably got into the suitcase on his own. I do believe that how I have no idea, but she's calm when she's talking about that one detail. This mouth covering behavior is very common in people who've lost somebody and they're trying to make a statement, except that in this video, it's out of place in this clip. It's in all the places we would expect emotion, and there's not much emotion at all. And in most cases, you would see it during the discovery of the body and during talking about this shocking moment, more likely when we're going to see mouth covering behaviors. Here we see it all over the place, specifically in the moments that are potentially deceptive. And just for the record, she hasn't mentioned his name one time yet. She says him and he. So you've had a second to kind of collect yourself. Tell it to me again. You guys were playing last night, drinking a bottle of wine. Putting puzzles together, doing artwork. Doing puzzles, artwork. Okay. Had a bottle of wine and then decided to play hide and seek. Mm-hmm. So he gets- What time was that? Do you remember? I mean, I know that I was in bed probably by like what, twelve thirty. Okay. Well, so I went upstairs at least, and I fell asleep, okay. forgetting that he was so in you the guys suitcase. Were playing the hide and go seek. Yes. And at some point, you put him in the suitcase. No, he got in the suitcase. So okay. he thought it would be funny to be put in the suitcase. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna joke with you, and I'll zip you up, and make him, you know, squirm a little bit, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But then I fell asleep. Mm-hmm. I fell asleep. Where was the suitcase? Right he where got it is. In it. Right down there? Yes. You zipped him in there? Yes. Thought he would be funny, a little joke. It was. We both were laughing about it. Okay. And then I fell asleep. Where did you fall asleep at? Upstairs. In your bedroom? Yes. Okay. Totally forgetting that he was in the suitcase still. Okay. And then you came back downstairs? This morning? Or this afternoon, yes, when I got up. Park, what time? 12, 30-ish. I was awake, but I totally forgot that he was in the suitcase. He can tell you there's a lot of things that I slash we have been going through jobs. Yeah, he did tell me. Life, all stuff. that good stuff. So I just totally so forgot. So you began to do CPR on him? Yes. Yes. Um, about Any what gurgle. time this morning he did gurgled. you start doing that CPR? No, it was the afternoon. It was afternoon it was because the afternoon. I was awake, but then I finally decided to come downstairs at like 1230-ish, whatever it is. And I was like, oh, I forgot he was in the suitcase and he wasn't moving. Nothing was happening. So I unzipped him, unzipped him, unzipped him, took him out and started doing CPR on him. He was on his way over here. I called you when he got here. Once he got here, you called him? Yes. Okay. And it, like air was coming out and he was gurgling, but mm-hmm. 
I could just tell by looking at him. But you knew how to do CPR, you were doing that on your own? Yes. Okay. And then right. the person that was on the phone with me also, I counted with him doing it. And he's got no medical, he doesn't take any medication? I don't know. Like, I don't know medical-wise. Like, what, I know he doesn't take any medications whatsoever. Okay. Um, the only thing, like I said, I don't know if alcohol had to do with it, but we had a bottle of wine. Okay, all right. Here's, I want you to sit back down because I don't want Can you. Can I have one more sip of water, please? Yeah, go, go on. Denver, 29, residential, audible, 1303 Island Day Drive. I'll do what I can to get you a cup because I don't want you to have to keep doing that. The maintenance should have a proper cancel medication for front door. 32 at 1325. See motor units on the channel. Like the cups are like right there. Okay. Sit right here. Don't talk to the ex husband right now. Oh, I won't. Okay? I won't. Can I have a cigarette, please? Ma'am, I can't take anything out of the house. It's on the back porch. Nope. All of it. It's secure, okay? I'll try my best to get you what you need, okay? Maybe one of these deputies cut. has a, a pack from someone, some, you know, sit down and I'll try and get you what you need, okay? Just cut, please. Okay. I don't want you on your feet. You want a camera still? It's natural. You're nervous. You I'm have your anxiety, that. you're scared, right? I don't know how to explain it to you. It's okay. You don't have to. I don't know how to. I'm just waiting for whoever, so... I can tell you this. I'm going to be here just as long as you are. Including my... It's going to be a while. I'm, I'm welcoming this place right now. It's kind of warm. All right, so just bear with us. I know. All right? If you could, like, give me whatever updates or anything that you know of, that's just how I work, so I know, like, kind of what... Well, let me look at my computer, see. All right, Chase, what do you got? This uh, video is just a person seeking some kind of update to her status. Nothing to do with the case, nothing to do with the discovery, nothing to do with the po police. It's all about what's going to happen to me. And people who are honest have no problem saying what's going to happen to me. What's going on with me? When can I go? When can I go home? I'm getting out of here. People who are guilty have a hard time asking that question. A, they probably don't want to know the answer. And B, they don't want to look suspicious because they feel suspicious already. That's all I got on that one. Mark? Yeah, nice. Um, look, and I think uh, th these officers are great, by the way, in my, in my opinion. Uh, this guy, uh, I think he knows he's got the perpetrator as well. Because here's what he says. He says, you're nervous, anxiety scared right he doesn't say uh, you're upset you're distraught you're in shock because you know if 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 somebody had died in in my home especially somebody who i had a you know a really really strong relationship with i would be uh, upset i would be distraught i would be in shock for sure he doesn't mention any of those things because i don't think he's seeing any of those things and i think he knows why he's not seeing any of those things what he sees is nervousness anxiety and fear scared and he calls them out well just as you were saying chase uh she's looking for information she wants to know um can you give me any updates you know and so yeah he, he kind of calmly goes over to his car and says, yeah, I'll look on my computer, see what I can find for you there. Super calm. Great, great officer. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, she's doing a lot of adapting here. When we say adapting, it can be any kind of nervous energy release. And I often say it's a way to make the unknown known, the, com the uncomfortable comfortable. In my years of working around prisoners, when you capture people, those things really, really roll up because now they're in a new place. They have to make themselves comfortable. Maybe playing with their nails, twirling their hair, pinching themselves, all kinds of stuff. And you're seeing that showing up in her. She's trying to make herself comfortable. She's starting what I call her intelligence collection about what's happening. Look, most of us have not been involved with the death of a loved one. And so we are, especially with a police investigation. So what's next? I think you're right, Chase. It's normal, but whether she's being deceptive about all the details about what happened or not, it's clear that she's admitted she's been involved. So she's asking what's next. What she isn't asking that's interesting 
is what's going to happen to him? What's next? When does his body get taken care of? Where does that go? And if you're really close to somebody, there's no rub, none of that. You're, you you think a lot about that person who is lying back there and something has happened to, whether you caused it or not. So it makes you then start to wonder, yeah, she's not the warmest of people about this guy. So then that gives me a reason to ask those questions later. We're building a profile of who this person is as we go into interrogation. Once you get into interrogation, things change. And remember, she is what she has done is identified him as not authority. She's talking to him like a guard. She's not talking to him like somebody who is collecting information. That's an interesting piece of it because she talked to that other officer very differently. In an interrogation, we plug guards into cells who befriend our prisoners and they give them information all the time. It's a powerful tool. Scott, what do you got? All right. Since you guys have covered most everything, I'll talk about uh, why she's sitting there. They're doing a great job of just letting her sit there. Here, you sit over here. We'll be back in a few minutes and let that stuff wind up in her brain and keep let her bounce all that stuff around. And I'm not I'm under the impression it's not a very big brain because of the way she because of her vernacular, her sentence structure and what she the things she repeats. I don't think we're dealing with somebody who's super smart here. No offense to anybody and all that, but she's not very smart. And I think we're going to see that come through a little bit later on as well in in a really big way. Um, she's talking about how she's dizzy and she's weak because she's worried and her brain is starting to, 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 like I was saying before, loop up and start looping that thing. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? She's not worried about her physical appearance, how she looks at other people. A lot of times in situations like that, you don't, but the way she's sitting and the, and, and the way she's wiping her face on her chin and all those kind of things that some, uh, there's something I think something's missing here anyway, uh, right out of the gate uh, with this with this person. It seems to me like anyway, I don't know. I'm not a psychologist or psychiatrist, but that behavior looks a little bit odd to me. That that lack of, of worrying how you look to others. I know when something dramatic or, or traumatic happens, we don't care what we look like. That's the last thing on our mind. She's had time to sit there and think and straighten up and, and at least get some composure about her. She has none. However, she's pretty hung over too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could be 90% of it could be that she's hung over. Uh, but again, she's not showing the, the right, like Mark was saying, she's not showing the, the emotions she should be showing. She's not showing anything. She's, she's just, I mean, that should be there. It's just somebody sitting there on the sidewalk worried about what's going to happen to them. It's natural. You're nervous. I'm, you have I'm your anxiety. Now. You're scared, right? I don't know how to explain it to you. It's okay. You don't have to. I don't know how to. I'm just waiting for whoever, so. I could tell you this. I'm going to be here just as long as you are, including my... I'm, I'm welcoming this breeze right now. It's kind of warm. All right? So just bear with us. I know. All right? If you can, like, give me whatever updates or anything that you know of, that's just how I work. So I know, like, kind of what well, Let me look at my computer see. <laughs> uh, she wants to say something. She wants to talk. Come on. Yeah.
I'm like really scared. I want you guys to know that. You like, have, I'm, look around. We have all these deputies here, so while we're here, nothing's going to happen to you. Before we go and make any notifications, you'll have plenty of time to, to leave or do what run. you need to do. Whatever you need to do. Okay? And we can talk about that more in length. But, yeah, you. Can it's I do not going to be a surprise. Real quick and then, but, um, like, I don't. Like, this was totally, like, not intentional. Like, that's what I'm scared about, too. Like, hey. we'll, we'll have all the answers. We'll, we'll have a lot more answers tomorrow after medical. After medical all right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one because here we're going to see the difference. Now we've been talking to patrolmen or officers, whatever they call, wherever they are, and they are there just to sequester the scene to make sure nobody crosses, to make sure everything's safe and that, that nothing else happens in, in effect. They'll collect information, but the detectives, when they show up, are going to go after information immediately. I don't know if she can tell the difference. I know she knows that there's somebody else, but I don't know that she understands that delineation. A lot of people don't. And if you're ever de dealing with a crime, you'll have to pay attention to know that difference. Um, there's a lot of nervous energy and there should be here for her. She's doing that thing I call the egg protector and she's face touching a lot. She should be nervous because something's just changed. She may even be biting her nail. I couldn't tell whether she knows her now or not. Now these guys are driving everything that happens. She starts trying to collect and tell she starts asking them questions. Do you know why? That's a really dangerous game if you are the perpetrator and you are in this situation. Because if I were talking to her, elicitation immediately, I would turn around and go, what would your guess be, Sarah? Boom. I would turn it right around on her. Or I would do a provocative statement. Well, we think it's cause, boom, just to see how she responded. That's awkward. And I think it's very difficult the way they respond. When they first start to respond, the woman says that, well... We'll know a lot more tomorrow as far as him. You could easily have just said, hey, what can you do to help us out? But they don't. They start down a different path, and we'll see where that goes over time. But as she gets more apprehensive, the thing I was just telling you, she's a great example of it because all this part of her body, all of the muscles from like intercostals and up are tightening and drawing her up to the point where her hands are in front of her face, and she's shrinking. She's turning into this little little image of herself, not even the same person. So she's now gone from a single mouth barrier to double praying hands at her mouth, showing that she's feeling more stress and she's rising. And when that isn't enough sacred space, what I mean by sacred space is barriering and releasing nervous energy. She does both hands to her mouth. That's, and then she does something really idiosyncratic. I've looked for this again. She does that thing where her chin boss pushes out and she puts her like a little hamster or something, he puts her hands up under her jaw. It's a really weird thing that I've not seen that in people. So it's something for her. And then the guys say, well, we're here. Nothing's going to happen to you. They're already starting to move in the position of protector and caregiver and that. I'm not going to go over and over much more of this because there's a lot in here. But I do see her lower lip withdraw. And then I think this woman sees authority as like a kid talking to a principal. And I think if you play that right, you get something. If you play that wrong, you lose them. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, we're seeing a whole lot of fear. So if you just look at, if you rewatch this clip with no sound and just say, are arteries and organs being protected uh, regularly here? We're seeing a lot of that. And it, I think it's interesting. We hear the phrase, and I think I'm quoting this directly, like totally not intentional like which I thought was pretty interesting. And she's vacillating here, like Greg was saying, between the uterus and neck protection, back and forth, covering neck, covering the, the lower abdomen. And instead of using his name, she just becomes curious about the gurgling sound. Why? Not, not stressed about it, not worried about it, not traumatized by it, not shocked by it, just wants a, wants a little science lesson there. I thought that was super strange. This is where if I'm the detective, I might have a prop and have like one of those little tiny digital voice recorders and say, uh, does this belong to you or your boyfriend? Do you know who placed it in the kitchen last night? Do you know why it was was left on all night? And that just plants a mind virus. I might use like a uh, maybe a punishment or I'm sorry, not a punishment question. I might use a a leading question about this voice recorder. Maybe why was this left in the kitchen? 
Of course, she's not going to say it's hers. And this is planting a mind virus that she could not escape from, knowing that there is some kind of recording that could exist about what happened in that room last night. Just an interesting uh, trick, I would say. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, you preempted me there, Chase, on the fillers. Normally, I preempt you. This time, you got in there early. However, I believe, in my estimation, you missed a couple out. What I got was, but like, like, this was totally not intentional, like, and then another like. In my estimation, there were a couple more likes in there, which only add more spice to what you've already stated there. For me, you know, if you like the Penelope pit stop, we now have, uh, for the English viewers, a Vicky Pollard, which is this no but yeah but, no but yeah but going on. I think that's what we have here. Once we get that, that's a surefire sign that there is somebody in, in big trouble here. Because really, all you need to say, instead of but like, like, this was totally not intentional, like, and then another like, I mean, there's bits in between, but those are the fillers. All you'd need to say was, uh, this was an accident. That's all. This was an accident. But there's so many fillers and negatives in there or double negatives that there's a red flag up for me. And that's all I got on that one. Uh, Scott, what do you got? I agree, Mark. I think there's a little Britain in her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is. <laughs> anyway, so now she's back to looking worried and she wants to know what the cops know. So her body language has gone back like you guys been saying to this protection mode and she's covering her stomach and she's touching her face and, and I'm just going over what you guys have gone over before. But she's very still up to a point to uh, compared to what she's been to been through so far. She's she's very still until it goes off the rail, not off the rails, but it starts getting sort of hyped up here in a couple of minutes. And we see some more of the classic stress uh, behaviors with the adapters, rubbing her arm, pulling on her arm, um, her hands covering her neck. And Greg, I've seen little children do that. That's She does a lot of things little kids do. So that's, I don't know, that's, that, that's yeah. the only time I've seen that is just when, uh, I just remember when I first saw that, I said, oh, I, I know a little kid that used to do that when, it, when she was a little kid. Um, and also, when the, the detective is explaining how she'll have time to do, to do the things she needs to do, she says, run. And I thought for sure that somebody would call it out and go, yeah, like she's going to run off. But I think she's probably a runner looking at, the, at those shorts he has on. Maybe she's she, maybe she exercises, maybe she jogs or something or, or runs around the, the neighborhood or something. But I think that's what she's talking about at that point. But she's not thinking about running off, like fleeing or anything like that. You guys covered most everything, so I'll leave it there. <laughs> Get good, put your tuna. Uh, she wants to say something. She wants to talk. Come on. Yeah. Well, we're here, so. So that we will not know the answer to that because we're not doctors. So what's going to happen? I'll know a lot, hopefully a lot more tomorrow morning as far as him. Um, but I cannot, there's no way I could say how, why. So just by looking at him, like, why is he purple? Oh, that's just, that's normal when someone passes away. Lividity, you turn. So the heart stops beating and the blood starts to settle <laughs> to the lowest points of the body. And then it just comes very pronounced. So that's the I'm like really scared. I want you guys to know that. You like have, I'm, look around. We have all these deputies here, so while we're here, nothing's going to happen to you. Before we go and make any notifications, you'll have plenty of time to, to leave or do what run. you need to leave. Whatever you need to do. Okay? And we can talk about that more in length. But yeah, you. We're not, it's not going to be a surprise. Real quick, and then, but um, like, I don't. Like, this was totally like not intentional. Like, that's what I'm scared about, too. Like, hey. we'll, we'll have all the answers. We'll, we'll have a lot more answers tomorrow after medical Too, like, hey. Yeah. We'll have all the answers. We'll have a lot more answers tomorrow after medical after medical Like she said, what, 
you're seeing here is Carmen. This is us coming out Protocol. to the scene. Yeah. We his age, no no real medical history that, that we know, I know of. of. For him to have passed away, we come out and I we know. do an investigation. Yeah. We come out and do an investigation. Medical examiner's office will be sending people out. This is what we do. If he was 75 years old and had a history of heart condition, we wouldn't be here. I just don't know what his, I don't know what it is. Exactly. And that's what we're here to find out. We're just here to get the answers. The answers that you want, the answers that his family's going to want. I just want. really want to see my son. Like, I really need to see my son. Well, I mean, I know I can't go anywhere, but. Right. So do I just like sit out here and wait for you guys? If you would, yes, please. Is, is anybody else having to show up or everybody's here that needs to be here? Uh, my team's here yeah. that needs to be here. The medical examiners will show up when we call them, but we're not ready for them yet. So they're going to take him, they're going to take some photos, take him, but that's towards the end of it. Um, and they'll be called well in advance when we're ready for them, but we're, we're not ready for them at this point. So we won't be calling them quite yet. Okay. So like I said, I got to go do some paperwork. I am. Um, they're going to chat um, with some people and then we're going to come back and, and talk to you if you're okay with that. Yes, um, so just give us a little bit more time. Um, like I said, I need to go and do that. And he's going to go do this. So, Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so um, it's a baseline now, this protective uh, piece that she's doing. It comes up, it goes down, it's tucked right in. Uh, it's now almost, you know, static for her that she's in here and here, which is, you know, clearly she's under a lot of stress right now. But there are two big deviations from that kind of baseline of stress. One is the shoulders go up and her hands go out for, I, I don't know, which is this kind of thing of what are you going to do? I, I don't know anything. I think there's a deviation from baseline on that because that is her strategy. That's her, that's her big tactic here is I'm going to do just I don't know stuff. We'll see uh, because because I think we got another episode that will come up next week uh, on the interview. So we'll see whether that strategy plays out in the uh, the interrogation, the interview. But I think that's her strategy right now. Play, I, I don't know, what are you gonna do about it? And then there's another deviation from baseline, which maybe it's similar to the kind of hamster that you were talking there, Greg. So maybe this is idiosyncratic, but it's a little bit lower and it's kind of scurrying around stuff that goes on. A little bit of piano playing or maybe spiders or insects. So. And it's on. Is every is everyone is everyone here <laughs> now? Now, wh whether she whether this is just idiosyncratic could be, or whether it's just like is everybody here? Can the band start? I, you know, let's start a number. Could be could be that, or maybe it is the metaphor in her mind of insects or spiders scurrying round something low to earth, something a, a little bit malignant around us scurrying around that that they're gonna you know search out in every corner and she'll be found out i don't know which one it is i quite like the metaphor idea for that of scurrying insects but as greg was saying before about about that other gesture more up here could be totally uh, idiosyncratic anyway two nice deviations from baseline there scott what do you got on this one all right, I'm not going to have much to, to add to this thing. We're seeing pretty much the same behaviors. You're right about the, the, the change in her baseline there a little bit. Um, she's, again, concerned with what's going to happen. Could she go see her son? All those kinds of things. But we're not seeing the, the correct facial expressions we should be seeing. We see some of them later on. We'll, we'll talk about that later, like uh, Mark was talking about. But we're not, we're not seeing the, the, the horror we should be seeing for what's happened. She's seen this guy. She's uh, after this has happened. She was she was part of it. All those things. And we're just not seeing what we should we should be seeing. We're not hearing what we should be hearing in the fashion we should be hearing it. It just sounds she's trying too hard. You know, I don't think she knows what to do. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, what we see is her whole body is now attached at her elbows or by or around her torso, creating that exoskeleton for those organs. And she keeps, put, she almost looks like a little T-Rex. She's only got arms from here down and she's moving those arms. That's part of the reason I think you see that scurrying mark is because she's not moving her elbows. They're, they're spot welded to her body. So she'll put her hands up here. It's almost like some really stupid comic where you see these guys doing just their hands around their face. Um, there's, I forget which guys did something funny with that back in the like eighties. They would, 
turn their head upside down and use their hands and yeah. make those, you know, when, when I'm talking about, you'll probably think of it. Mark, the one that I was expecting you to cover is all that joint protection. She's protecting those fingers and rolling them in. That's showing I've run out of ways to protect myself otherwise. So let me protect my fingers while I'm at it too. She's feeling a lot of fear in here, a lot of fear of what's coming. She also does a lot of self-grooming. And for me, I think what we see is an unsophisticated person who's hungover is part of it. So we see a lot of things that we might think are abnormal, but they may be normal for her world. I don't know what she does for a living. Don't know anything about it. She's awfully inst- interested in the process and all these people are coming in. I think part of that's her brain trying to get some normal and she's asking questions about who else is coming about the process. Not at all about him, nothing about him yet. She does throat protecting. She does those prayerful hands and she does that exoskeleton. Here. I think she's just at her processor end probably and I don't know that she really grasps what's going on with these guys talking to her. It feels like they're being helpful and she's trying to tell them kind of what happened. She's not keenly aware of what they do for a living. I think Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you guys. I don't have much else here, but uh, we, we also see a desperation to inject more ambiguity into what's going on and this fearful body posture the whole time. And you'll notice that the fear increases with every desire to collect data. Every single time, that's when you'll see these little spikes. In situations like this, you'll often see guilty people more concerned with two things. And these two things are so common, you can almost use them alone as a guide when you're seeing the behavior of a post-crime witness. Number one is a desire to inject doubt, ambiguity, and uncertainty Number two is a desire to learn about the process and information known by the police. They will almost always have those in common. Innocent people are more likely to say things in cases like this that implicate their own guilt because of sincere and deeply felt guilt. Like, I killed him. I can't believe I did it. I I, I killed him. And they're more likely to say things like that. And still, no mention of a name unwilling to ask if she's a suspect. Innocent people would have no problem with that. She's desperate to know what they're thinking and is unwilling to ask. Why not just ask? Innocent people don't have a problem asking, what are you going to do next? What's going to happen next? So we're not looking at a single behavior and determining a likelihood of guilt. We're watching for these groups of behaviors that we've all been talking about here that we know to look for. When that little pile of behavior starts turning into a mountain, which it is here, it becomes a lot more obvious and apparent to us uh, what's going on. That's all I got. Oh, Mark, that was a good pin spin, man. Uh, Mark, I've got it all. I'm triple threat. (laughs) Apparently, obviously. And that's what we're here to find out. We're just here to get the answers. The answers that you want, the answers that his family's going to want. I just want. really want to see my son. Like, I really okay. need to see my son. Okay. I mean, I know I can't go anywhere, but. Right. Yeah. So do I just, like, sit out here and wait for you guys? If you would, yes, please. Is, is anybody else having to show up, or everybody's here that needs to be here? Uh, my team's here yeah. that needs to be here. The medical examiners will show up when we call them, but we're not ready for them yet. So they're going to take him, they're going to take some photos, take him, but that's towards the end of it. Um, and they'll be called well in advance when we're ready for them, but we're, we're not ready for them at this point. So we won't be calling them quite yet. Okay. So like I said, I got to go do some paperwork. I um, they're going to chat um, with some people and then we're going to come back and, and talk to you if you're okay with that. Yes, um, so just give us a little bit more time. Um, like I said, I need to go and do that. And he's gonna go do so more time. Um, like I said, I need to go and do that and he's gonna go do this. So, yeah. but do you guys tell his family like today or yeah, after tomorrow? We, will. we have to. Yeah, we still have to go to make contact with the family. Yeah. They have to be notified. 
Once our investigation is pretty much complete here, we once we leave here, we will be going to. But again, you'll know. I'm not going to just go and do it without you knowing. You'll know. We'll we'll talk to you prior to doing anything like that. But how? I mean, I understand what you guys and how you do it, and Mm -hmm. you know. So, but like, what do you just tell him? What do you tell his parents? Like, what's the reason? We tell him what we know at that point. Yeah. We tell him the truth. That we're gonna be waiting for the autopsy results, and I will be at the autopsy in the morning. And hopefully, the doctor will be able to give me some of what they think and see. Yeah. We'll um, give them their number. They can contact them and get it from them. But yeah, they're gonna they're gonna know what we're here, what you know, what we're investigating, and that we're still. We they're gonna think I killed him. Why would they? Think they always have said that. They've always, always, always have said that. Have I said? told you it's because I'm the blue-eyed white dragon. That's what they call me. Because they don't want him with me. So he's basically just not really been around his family because he chooses me over them. Even after I've encouraged him numerous times to go there and see his family. All right, Chase, what do you got? All right, so I'm going to do something way different with this video that, than we've ever done before. I'm going to build a behavior profile just using one video. Then we'll test the hypothesis on the interrogation video when that one comes out. So we see opening behaviors in here, but we only see opening body behaviors when she's doing good things. Uh, when she's saying he chooses me over them, I encouraged him to talk to his family. We're seeing open behaviors. We see self-soothing behaviors at points of social discomfort, family finding out, investigation data, and how she's being perceived. That's uh, when she's saying things like, they never accepted me. She starts rubbing her arm up, up and down here very gently. Finally, we see protective and fearful behaviors, which means the body is somehow protecting arteries, joints, and organs, those three things. And we see that around his family threatening her about uh, finding out Uh, Family threatening her, finding out about case details, desiring more information from the detectives. So here's what the profile might say. Just based on these alone, let's look at a potential profile so far. She's socially driven. She wants to be seen as a positive force in his life. Very easily scared with threats of how she might be perceived by others. This might come in handy in the interrogation room. She's going to react very positively to compliments about her taking care of other people and being a good person in general. So just from this one video, we formed a tiny little behavior profile. Let's see if it can help us out in the interrogation. Scott, what do you got? All right. Well, along with the behaviors we've seen so far, she's doing two things. Number one, she's trying to figure out if they're starting to talk about this like it's a murder. With the questions she's asking, she's trying to find out if they're going, huh, I, th- I think you're in big trouble. And she, she, it's not connecting with them because I don't think they're listening properly. But that's what she's trying to do. And number two, she's beginning to create her protection story. This, this, this thing she's going to stand behind and say, here's what actually happened. That's the story that's going to help build this, this protective wall against her and whatever the onslaught is that's coming toward her. Um, and she knows it's again. She talks about how the family is going to talk negative about her, how how they and they have they call her the white dragon and all kinds of stuff. She's fought with his sister and and those types of things. So she's basically circling the wagons, getting ready for the the big fight on this. Greg, what do you got? I think you give her too much credit, honestly. I think what she is worried about is an ass whipping by somebody who thinks she murdered their son, brother, whatever it is. Yeah. I think when she said run earlier. She was talking about run from the family because she's fearful of what's going to happen. I think she's so focused on that, Scott. I don't think she sees half of what we see, because if you the only reason I say that is because she goes, you actually see shock when they said, yes, we will tell them what we know. First time we've seen shock. And for me, that's interesting because it tells me she's focused on something other than the fact these guys may arrest her. Look. What we can't tell, all this body language we're seeing, we can't tell what's in her head. We can't tell what her intent was. We can tell she was involved. She's got all this classic symptoms we all are hearing. But what we can't tell is what's going on in her head. And then she does shock here. And then she goes to internal conversation. 
as she listens and trying to figure out what they mean when they say we're going to tell them what we know. And then she says, they'll think I did it. And the first good question I've heard yet from these two is why would they think that? Why would they think that? That that's powerful. And there's some good baseline that you guys are all on it. She's open. She's doing this baseline when she's saying, they'll think I did it. He chose, I chose him over me or he chose me over them. And then the barriers and all that, when she talks about their family is why I think, I don't think she understands how the gravity of the situation. I think she's more worried about what they're going to do than the fact she might spend the rest of her life in prison. Just my opinion. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So often when you're thinking about somebody's behavior, you can look into what other people have predicted about their behavior. Now, of course, that's hearsay, essentially, and it's never going to stand up in a court or it shouldn't stand up in a court. But it, it is part of some of the data that you can take in as part of a bigger intelligence system. So there is a predicted pattern of behavior from the the in-laws. They're going to think I've killed him. They have always, always said that. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, we don't know whether that's true, that that they have said that, and we don't know whether it's true that their their observation or their, their theory is right. But it's an interesting coincidence, isn't it, that these two things match up. Then she trips over, because I think you're right, I don't think she's quite intelligent enough to do this on purpose, but she trips over a couple of images there. She says that they that she is the belied, or she, she pronounces it belied, which is an interesting word to use. I think I'm correct in that she uses the word belied. The belied white dragon. Well, so I don't know whether she remembers doing Shakespeare's sonnet 130 mm -hmm. at school. I, my mistress' eyes are nothing like the sun's, where there's the idea of um, the bel belied with false compare, the idea that you have been called something bigger and more grandiose than what you are. So it's interesting she puts forward this grandiose idea of a white dragon because you know she could have said look they think i'm just dirt or they think i'm just you know a a a, 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 a virus or a wretch or a you know something but no it's a big grandiose white dragon white dragon in interesting uh symbol as well um uh, usually in in chinese mythology uh put right next to death uh omen of death ferocious power uh in in the norse and the saxon mythology uh it's it's put next to wotan which is an oppressive power so the white dragon is something that oppresses so much that it ends in death so that's an interesting <laughs> image that she just tripped over. If if anybody is ever interested in Jungian psychology, here's potentially a good example of it just flourishing and blossoming in front of us. There we go. That's all I've got on that one. So the Wotan clan is part of that? So the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yes, different, different Wotan. Different Wotan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure. Once our investigation is pretty much complete here, we once we leave here, we will be going to. But again, you'll know. You're not going to just go and do it without you knowing. You'll know. We'll talk to you prior to doing anything like that. But how? I mean, I understand what you guys and how you do it, and mm -hmm. you know. So, but like, what do you just tell him? What do you tell his parents? Like, what's the reason? Away. We tell him what and, we know at that point. Yeah. We tell him the truth. And that we're going to be waiting for the autopsy results. And I will be at the autopsy in the morning. And hopefully the doctor will be able to give me some of what they think and see. Yeah. We'll um, give them their number. They can contact them and get it from them. But yeah, they're going to they're gonna know what we're here, what, you know, what we're investigating. And that we're still we they're gonna think they killed him they always have said that they've always 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 have said that have i said? told you it's because i'm the blue-eyed white dragon that's what they call me because they don't want him with me so he's basically just not really been around his family because he chooses me over them 
even after I have encouraged him numerous times to go over there and see his family. All right, now let's throw it around the room and talk about what we think we've seen so far. Let's try to wrap it up in 30 seconds or less. Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, if uh, she wants us to think that she is not heavily, heavily involved in this, it didn't go well from the start on this. And I think the, the officers who showed up right at the start, we're getting a sense of that. Let's see where uh, the investigators take it, but not a good start, I would say. Chase, what do you think? So I'm going to give you one nugget here. You, you should probably write this down because it's a good one. I think this comes down to does the person reasonably feel like they can predict their future? Do they know what's coming next? Guilty people are far less likely to feel like they, they know what's coming next or they can predict what's going to happen in their lives the next few days. Innocent people have no problem saying, I'm going to be in bed tomorrow night and, and the next night after that and the next night after that. So a lot of that comes down to that. And we see a whole video here with a person who has their ability to predict the future has gone to zero. Greg? Yeah, one thing we have to point out is you can be naive and believe all day that you have some control over your life and believe that simply by saying, I didn't mean to go to sleep, you could be absolved of any involvement in the person's death. That's not how the court system works. I say all the time, interrogation is an intentional outcome desired when you go in. So you're after getting something and finishing it. So this person may feel confident, may feel like she's confident because she doesn't understand the way the court system and the way law works. Every law has an ele has elements that you have to satisfy to mean that the person has violated that rule and can be charged. And those can be very tricky. So while she has openly admitted, hey, I put him in the suitcase, I zipped it up, then I fell asleep. It's not my fault. That's not necessarily the way the courts will see it. So she may feel confident and may get be in for a rude awakening. Scott, what do you got? I think this is a great example of seeing somebody who comes into the situation with a story or their idea for a story, but they haven't had enough time to talk about it and think think about it, work their way through it, knock the things out of the way that don't sound right to, to uh, um, verify it with themselves yet, make it sound true. And as she goes through, she starts adding these things and these fake emotions to start to, to look like she's really sincere about how surprised she was about she fell asleep and just can't believe that 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 happened because she fell asleep. I think it's I think it's a great example of seeing but somebody who's not very smart trying to um, almost take advantage of that, I think, or may I may be giving her too much credit. But um, I, it, I think it's a great example of seeing somebody get in there and try their hardest to find out what's going on for, you know, with the cops and finding out, trying to find out if they're going to be in trouble or not, as they set up this little rinky dink, dink story to help protect themselves. All right, fellas, I think this was another good one and we'll see you next time. Um, so what do you got?